you can tell me when to start. Uh, let me explain. This is a mathematics talk, uh, and I'm by training a mathematician. But I hope it's motivated mathematics that it's appropriate to your interest in bioinformatics. Uh, and th this topic of MM algorithms is one that I have been working on for many years. I have just published a book by Siam will be the publisher coming out this month. Uh, and if you want to read more about it, that would be the recommended place. Okay, so why are we interested in algorithms and why, what's the connection with mathematics? Well, m much of bioinformatics data mining is driven by estimation procedures, and estimation procedures are usually based on some kind of optimality criterion. Uh, so this MM principle is a way of designing optimization algorithms. It's a principled way of designing algorithms. And these algorithms are very uh, appropriate to high dimensional settings. So I don't have to stress here that many of the problems you face are very high dimensional. And classical methods of optimization don't cut it very well in this setting because they involve things like Newton's method or scoring, which involve, for instance, very large matrix inversions. Matrix inversion is, is a relatively expensive process. So we need some way of breaking out of this bottleneck, and this principle is one way of doing that. So it, the MM algorithm is not an algorithm. It's a principle or it's a prescription for constructing algorithms. And I'll show you how that works in some concrete examples. The EM algorithm in statistics is a particular case of the MM algorithm. The Dempster, Laird, and Rubin paper in 1977 that was published c collecting much of the known knowledge about EM is the second most cited paper in statistics. It probably has close to 50,000 citations. There was a parallel effort, very interesting, carried on at UCLA by a man named Jan Delu, who was until recently the chair of the stat department. He's Dutch. He started out in Holland. In 1977, he p published a paper which was the first application of the MM algorithm. His paper has maybe 300 citations. And the field completely missed the importance of the work he was doing, somewhat because it was presented obscurely and somewhat because it was focused in almost entirely on multidimensional scaling. But people have come to realize over the years there's a much more important principle here that can be used in a very wide variety of situations. So how does MM work? Well, it starts by creating a surrogate function that's simpler than the objective function. And the surrogate function has to satisfy two properties. One property is tangency. So you think of iterating towards a solution, towards the maximum of a function, and you're at your current point. The tangency requirement is the surrogate is touching the objective at the current iterate. There's also a domination requirement, which is called majorization. And that means the <coughs> surrogate function lies above, is always greater than or equal to the objective function. So the MM principle says we'll operate on the surrogate function. And when we maximize it or minimize it, there's two varieties here, we will drive the objective function in the right direction, either uphill or downhill, depending on whether we are maximizing or minimizing. So MM stands for, it's an acronym for either majorize, minimize, or minorize, maximize. The first case for minimization, the second case for maximization. OK, so this is some, some of the history I was mentioning. Uh, and the list of applications here is much longer now. This slide was prepared several years ago. Uh, it's turning out to be one of the most pervasive ideas in uh, modern optimization. 
Okay, so what can you achieve by this, using this principle? Well, it can, by separating parameters, avoid these very large matrix inversions and allow you to update one parameter at a time. So you reduce a high dimensional problem to a sequence of one dimensional problems or lower dimensional problems. So parameter separation can avoid large matrix inversion. You can linearize optimization and you do that when you create quadratic surrogates whose derivatives are linear or affine. It can deal gracefully with inequality and equality constraints because by definition they're built into the optimization of the surrogate function. I'll show you an example where it can restore symmetry and most closed form answers in mathematics depend on symmetry. So if you can restore symmetry you can, rest you can have a closed form solution for optimizing your surrogate that you won't have for your objective. And finally, it can turn a, a non-smooth, a kinky problem into a smooth problem. In smooth problems, you have all the tools of calculus then at your disposal. Okay, so I mentioned this already. Here's the two requirements. First one is tangency. So theta is your parameter vector, and we'll see what that is in concrete situations later, but this first condition is tangency. The second condition is domination, and that has to hold for all theta, or at least all the theta that you're going to consider when you optimize the surrogate. And you can work on uh, complicated functions piecemeal. You don't have to majorize the whole thing in one fell swoop. You can look at one piece, majorize that. You have another piece, oh, that's simple, we'll leave that alone. Here's another piece, we may have to majorize that, and so forth. And add these up and you get a majorization. So majorization is a relation that's closed under various operations, the most important one being uh, sums. Okay, if you minorize Instead of putting your surrogate function above, you put it below your objective function. And in minimization, we choose a majorizing function, and then we minimize it, and that produces the next point of the, of the iterate, of the algorithm. So here's a, a graph, very simple. This is a function with a kink, the lower function. Suppose we're trying to go to the bottom of that function. We majorize with the quadratic at our current point, say right there. The quadratic has to stay above the lower objective function. And in the MM algorithm, we move to the bottom of the surrogate and that produces the next iterate. So it's, it's actually quite a simple and geometrically uh, motivated idea. If you like, to delve into the history, it's to some extent motivated by Lyapunov functions and differential equations. Lyapunov functions, solutions of differential equations, ride downhill on the Lyapunov functions. Okay. Yeah. Well, generally globally, uh, it may be in certain circumstances if you're willing to look at the surrogate only in a, say along a line or in a local area, then it can be local. Most of the problems, it's global, but. Okay, the data are the BIJs, the thetas are the parameters of the model, and the model is this assignment of probabilities. Okay, so it's a restriction of the full space of what the probabilities could be, but it does reflect that greater skill should lead to a higher probability of winning. Okay? So, if we take logarithms, capacity of the log likelihood, you know from elementary statistics, maximizing the log likelihood is equivalent to maximizing the likelihood. Okay, so we work on the log likelihood. Now, what we want to do here is we want to split the parameters. And Here's the, here's the nasty piece. The log of theta i plus theta j. Those parameters are coupled. We can't s 
solve the optimization problem because we have all of these coupled parameters. So we create a surrogate function that separates the parameters. Now how do we do that? First of all, the term log theta i is already parameter separated, so we leave that alone. We work on the other term, and we use the supporting hyperplane property. Now, what's the convex function that we're going to be applying it to? It's minus log x. Minus log x. Log x looks like that. You turn it upside down, it looks like that. It's convex. OK, so minus log x is convex. Its derivative is minus 1 over x. This is the supporting hyperplane inequality. It's a, really, in one dimension, it's a supporting line inequality. Yes? This, you can fit this model in a variety of ways. And this is not the only algorithm for doing the optimization. But it, I introduce it so that you can understand the mechanics of how you derive algorithms in this setting. OK. So now we want to substitute for this minus log, the second, using this supporting hyperplane. Oops. OK. When we substitute, we get something that looks like this. We've replaced the second logarithm by a linear term. So, and you'll notice that all parameters are separated. What does that mean? Parameters are separated. All the parameters and all the terms involving theta one can be grouped together, and then add on the term the terms that involve theta two. Now you have to be careful because the theta n's and the thetas play a different role here. Theta n is your current iterate. It's an anchor point. It's not to be confused with how you're going to update the log likelihood. So we're optimizing on the left argument, not the right <laughs> argument. So as far as the left argument goes, this is a parameter separated function. We can optimize it by optimizing each parameter separately. And same for the, same for the uh, theta sub n um, to the n. These are the. This is not to the n, it's to the nth, that's the nth exactly. iterate. It's the previous iteration. Yes. Exactly. So okay. we. That's why they are, they are together. Yes. OK, so when we do the calculus, derivative of theta, log <laughs> theta i is 1 over theta i. <laughs> derivative of theta i is 1. We get an equation for theta i, which we can solve, and there it is. And it's very simple. And you can iterate this, and it will lead you invariably to the optimal point of the likelihood. Now, there has to be some caveats introduced here. For example, if you have a league and it's really two separate leagues, league A and league B, and they never play each other, you're not going to be able to rank all the teams. There has to be some way of ultimately comparing one team to another team. It may be through competition against a third team. But in general, this leads you right to the solution. Yes? The, the thetas are non-negative. You want them to be greater than 1. And it's certainly true that the update formula satisfies that property. Here it, it seems it's, to fall out of the well, it's because this log theta i term prevents you from going to zero. As you go to zero, that term goes to minus infinity. Uh, and we're trying to maximize, so we that's that keeps that's a boundary term that keeps us away from zero. Yeah. Uh, I think bi j a bit of i j a bit of j i. Well, i beats j, j beats i. Oh, okay. OK? OK, let's go on to a somewhat more useful example. Many of you probably have looked at clustering problems. And there are various classical algorithms for clustering. The most common one, possibly, is k-means clustering. k-means clustering is often done by an algorithm known as Lloyd's algorithm. You may not actually know the name, but that's, he's the guy that first thought of it. 
Okay, so I, I had a former postdoc and he sent me a paper recently where he had worked out what you do when you have missing features. So you may measure 10,000 things on each of a bunch of people. You want to cluster them. What happens if some of those features are missing on some people? Can you still carry out k-means clustering? And the answer is yes, and it's a, you can attack it by modifying Lloyd's algorithm. So what does Lloyd's algorithm do, in essence? It sets up an objective function. So the yij is the kth feature on subject j. Okay, the mu i k, mu i is the center of cluster i. So we want to sum, sum over all clusters. For a given cluster i, we want to look at all members of that cluster, and we want to see how well our current cluster center fits the observed features. Okay? Now, in this formulation, this theta j may be a deficient set. You don't have to have every item measured. You just, you're just working on the items that are actually measured. Okay? Okay, so how does Lloyd's algorithm uh, work. It's an interesting combination of discrete and continuous op optimization. You have two things that you can vary. You can vary the cluster centers and you can vary the cluster membership. Okay? And in Lloyd's algorithm, it's what's called a block descent algorithm. You first reassign cluster membership, then you recalculate cluster centers, then you reassign cluster membership, then you recalculate cluster centers. And you go on with that alternate block, those alternate block updates until the thing converges. Now there's no guarantee that this is going to uh, produce the absolute best cluster. Because this function, because of this discrete nature, well I pass over it, the objective function is not a convex function. So there's no guarantee that Lloyd's algorithm will actually give you the right answer. There are heuristics that suggest how to start Lloyd's algorithm so it's much more likely to give you the appropriate clustering. Okay, so in this missing data context, how do we carry out Lloyd's algorithm? Well, the reassignment to clusters, uh, uh, to clusters for a given individual j, you assign to the cluster i that minimizes this sum of squares. It's the deviations between the features and the cluster center. So you're going to take some subject and you're going to say, I want to find the cluster center that's closest to that individual's vector of measurements. But you, here we're allowing for missing data. Okay. now. That's a trivial adjustment of Lloyd's algorithm. What do you do about re-estimating the cluster centers? Do I have a question? Did you have a question, Eliezer? You? Okay. You symmetrize the problem. So you introduce a surrogate function. The original function was missing this second term here. Now, what does the second term do? The second term majorizes zero. Now what does that mean? It means all the terms are non-negative because they're squares and at the current iteration if I take mu equal to mu n all these terms equal zero. So I have a, a function which falls above the original objective function and equals it at the current cluster center. Does everyone get the idea? Okay. So, we've created the majorization. How do we optimize it? Well, this is the classical way of Lloyd's algorithm works. It redefines the cluster center by averaging over the observation vectors within the cluster. 
So this is the number of items in cluster I, and this, these are the observations. But those observations now are changed in this missing data framework because some of them are observed and some of them are imputed. Okay? But what has, what has this process done? It has guaranteed that we drive the objective function downhill. And that's probably the most we can ask of most algorithms when we're trying to minimize. The descent property of the EM algorithm guarantees when we optimize, we push the surrogate function downhill, we actually push the objective function downhill. So this is a satisfactory and very easy fix to Lloyd's algorithm that allows you to have missing data in your sample. Yes? Well, you, every time you do the reassignment, you have to re-impute. So it's an... Yes, so this, this depends on where the centers are currently because you have these imputed values for the missing values. Sure, but I'm asking now you reassign the observations after you recalculate. Yes, so the next thing the after this... using only the observed data again. That's right. So you use only the observed data for the membership reassignment, but you use the majorization trick to recalculate the centers. Now, you could majorize and do the membership uh, reassignment based on the majorized function, but I don't think that's as, quite as good a solution because it, it's going to pull the, it's going to pull a case towards its current uh, center too strongly. Okay, now, if you want a robust version of Lloyd's algorithm, you may have thought about this, because in some cases you will have outlier points that you don't want to influence your clustering too heavily. One thing you can do is you can replace sums of squares by sums of absolute deviations. Okay, now, the only thing you have to do in Lloyd's algorithm, the cluster, the membership reassignment is pretty much done the same way with that simple substitution. And the center reassignment, you replace the majorization here by this one. And now when you have, instead of a sum of squares, a sum of L1 norm differences, the solution to the problem, which I won't go into, is gotten by taking the median across each coordinate. Yeah? Is there any soft assignment going on in this, or, or at each step, it's the data point? This is a hard assignment. So this, this is distinct from the EM algorithm, which has certain advantages because of the soft assignments. But this is a hard assignment version. Other questions? Okay, uh, this is a slightly ambitious example, but let's see what we, what we can do with it. And this has, imaging is not exactly bioinformatics, but I thought you might be interested in this. So what does a CAT scanner do? It's tr transmission tomography. You're, you have an external X-ray source, you're beaming it through an object like a head, and you're detecting photons, X-rays on the other side, okay? So typically when these images are reconstructed, and we're not talking about simply projecting onto X-ray film, but actual mathematical manipulation to give you a much better image that you pixelate the surface. So you divide your region into little square pixels and you assign something called an attenuation coefficient to each pixel. That attenuation coefficient measures how strongly the material within the pixel is stopping x-rays. 
the denser the material, the higher the attenuation. So you want to estimate across a, lo a large pixelated landscape all these attenuation coefficients. And you're beaming the x-ray, it's a point source, on the other side is a detector, but it, in fact, when the data is gathered, it's a, a whole bank of detectors collecting over many different angles. So, and these lines of flight from source to detector are called projection lines. And the, this whole business, the noise is Poisson noise. It's completely random noise. So in fact, even though you're collecting data simultaneously in a fan across many projections, those counts that you're reading in the detectors, photon counts, are actually independent and all Poisson distributed. And you know, because of the design of the machine, how many photons are sent and are likely to be captured by a detector along a projection line in the absence of intervening material, so passing through a vacuum. Okay, now, in fact, what happens is the, some of the photons are stopped along a projection line, and that probability of being stopped is determined by a Poisson probability. Zero events doesn't make it th uh, through, or does make it through. There are, there are no capture events, and that's proportional to the attenuation coefficient times the intersection length of the projection line with the pixel. Here's a, my cartoon of the situation. You have a source over here. You actually have a bank of detectors. Here are your projection lines. Some of these projection lines intersect s short distances. Uh, well, and some, like here, this pixel, a very short intersection length. Some much longer distances. You have to scale those to get an appropriate uh, reconstruction. OK, so what does the log likelihood look like for data of this sort? It basically, the probability that a photon is transmitted along a projection and is ultimately detected is given by an exponentiated line integral. OK, so this is an inner product of attenuation coefficients against intersection lengths. And the number of photons detected is in fact as mean, it's Poisson distributed, as mean where the di constant is known times this probability of actually surviving the transversal from source to detector. Okay. By independence, the log likelihood can be written in this fashion. It's a sum of terms. This term is very nice because it's linear. Parameters are separated. We may have 10, 100,000 parameters in this problem. This term is not parameter separated, and it is an obvious obstacle to maximization. We're going to do maximum likelihood. However, what we can do <coughs> is we can note that we can write this in terms of functions of inner products where the fi, now its argument is a scalar s, is of this sort, and that is a strictly concave function. It's a linear piece, which is always convex, both convex and concave. It's a negative exponential, which is exponential is convex, it's negative is concave. So this is strictly concave. Okay, so in this example, you construct an algorithm by using the chord above the graph property, Jensen's inequality, the discrete version of it. So you have a concave function, you have a composition with a linear function, and now you set up certain constants, these ratios. The intersection lengths and the attenuations are all uh, non-negative numbers. So this is a non-negative number, and it's the sum of these coefficients is 1. 
So we can view this as now we write f of i of the linear function as a convex combination of points using these coefficients, which are non-negative and summed to 1, and Jensen's inequality for a concave function looks like this. You bring the constants out in front, and you isolate the arguments of the function inside. Now, this looks complicated, but the only parameter that's inside this function is theta j. We ignore the theta n's because we know what those are. Those are not what we're trying to estimate. So we have, in fact, separated the parameters. So if we take the surrogate function, we get from this majorization, and we're doing it term by term here for each i, uh, we get an overall minorization, separates the parameters, and you can, although you can't solve the equations for the single parameter updates exactly, you can solve them by Newton's method, which is a one-dimensional problem. <coughs> so you s reduce the whole exercise to a sequence of one-dimensional Newton graphs and updates, which is very simple. Now, in fact, in imaging, what people do is if you reconstruct according to this image, you get images that look quite grainy. The parameter, the pixels are not being very well controlled, the neighboring pixels, their, their attenuation coefficients. So you can introduce uh, terms which smooth the image, which penalize big differences between attenuation coefficients of neighboring parameters. And I won't go through the details, but if you put in those smoothing terms and you majorize or minorize them in the correct way, you can again, again split the parameters and solve the whole image reconstruction as a sequence of one-dimensional problems. So this is a quite a successful way. And what's, what's the virtue of it? Well, it's certainly slower than the traditional Fourier transform methods that get incorporated in modern CAT scanners. But because it's dealing directly with the noise and you do have noise when you generate x-rays. They're not a continuous, but they are quanta, and they come out randomly from your source. Because you're controlling the noise, you get a better image. The noise is exactly that uh, Poisson distribution that you, is that the noise? That that's the noise. Meant? Yes, that's the noise. The Fourier method is completely. The Fourier uh, methods, they take these exponentiated line integrals as deterministic quantities. They use something called the Radon transform, which is related to the Fourier transform. They do an inversion, and they get an image. But the noise has disappeared from the problem. Here, the method, the noise is up front. You deal with it directly. You get a better image, and you get an equivalent image with a lot lower dose. So reducing dose on x-rays is a good thing because x-rays cause mutations and ultimately cancer. OK. I'll go through one more example, and uh, I think I'll stop there. So discriminant analysis. A lot of what we do in bioinformatics is discriminant analysis. We have a feature vector on subjects. And we already have some of those subjects classified into various categories. We get a new subject, comes along, we have a feature vector, and we want to know how to classify that subject. Now, that's different. That's not the same thing as clustering. Clustering is unsupervised learning. This is supervised learning because you have cases that you have already classified, OK? And you want to classify new cases. Now, this is I'm going to show you something that is kind of a weird approach, but actually works pretty 
quite well in this problem. So you, th you geometrize the problem. So you imagine the classes as points in space, okay? And we want those points, if we have k plus one categories, we're gonna think of choosing k plus one vectors, think of those as vertices, and we're gonna put them on a regular tetrahedron. So if we have, for example, three classes in this setting, we would place them in the plane as the vertices of an equilateral triangle, okay? Now the virtue of an equilateral triangle is every vertex is the same distance from every other vertex. If we have four classes, we put them in three-dimensional space and we have a regular tetrahedron, you know, pyramid kind of arrangement, but all pairs of vertices are equidistant. Okay, now, <clears throat> To each assigned case, we assign it a coordinate vector, which is the vertex corresponding to its class. All right? And now we want to uh, fit the data so that we can predict unclassified cases. So we set up, for the observed cases, we set up an objective function and it's complicated. Here's a penalty, so we don't want these, these uh, the A, J's are, their transposes are the rows of this matrix. And uh, we, want, we want to basically find a linear predictor to classify the unclassified cases. So we're, we're going to estimate a matrix A and a column vector B. The feature vector for case I is XI. Okay, its classification vertex is UI. So we want the predictor to be close to the thing it's predicting, the classification. But we don't want, we, uh, we may have in many problems, many, many more features than we have classes. So we, we can get wildly over-parameterized problems, and you want some control over uh, the guard against overfitting. So that's where the penalty comes in. And this penalty constant, I won't go into the details, but it is, it is found by uh, what's called cross-validation. So it's, it's found designed to accommodate the data as well as possible. Okay, now we don't actually care that we're getting right at the predicted vertex. We want to get close, and we don't care too much about how close. So there's something here called epsilon insensitive distance here. It's like a Euclidean distance, but we subtract epsilon and we truncate it at zero. So if this number, if this if this were a Euclidean distance and it's below epsilon, so we're quite close to the predicted vertex, we would just make this whole term zero. That turns out to be a sensible thing to do. Okay, so let's go back and think about this. So choosing the vertices of a regular tetrahedron makes all vertices equidistance. Euclidean distance is less sensitive to large residuals than Euclidean distance squared. So if you go back and you look, we were dealing, our, in our objective function, we had Euclidean distance, not Euclidean distance squared. Euclidean distance squared is sensitive to large outliers. Euclidean distance is not. Here, this epsilon insensitive business doesn't make much difference how close the linear predictor is to the artificial indicator or the UI. Okay. And we regularize because uh, the number of cases is often much, uh, much smaller than the number of features. So you, mo most features are in fact irrelevant. And I'm not going to go through this, but you can get, using the Cauchy-Swartz inequality, a majorizer for this 
uh, epsilon insensitive distance. Let me just show you the, what it looks like, the points. So in one dimension, this epsilon insensitive distance, think of this as a 45 degree line, mm -hmm. plus one and minus one. So instead of, you're applying this f distance to vectors within this range, the distance is, gets crunched to zero. Okay, if you want to majorize something like this, it turns out you can do it with a quadratic. And I've shown a quadratic fitting there. <coughs> if you're in this range, then something else has to be done. You can still fit a quadratic. The only place you can't fit a quadratic is at the kink. Okay, so let's just look at some of the performance issues. So it, on standard problems, this turns out to do actually quite well. And if you follow through the details, which I don't have time to explain, it, but every iteration of the MM algorithm, because the, uh, of the parameter splitting, you can solve k different weighted least squares problems instead of a much bigger problem. These are smaller problems and they're much faster to solve than the original problem, which is very hard because of the peculiar nature of the uh, objective. And this is reasonably fast. And if you apply it to data sets, this I call vertex discriminant analysis, these are from the UC Irvine data repository on discriminant analysis problem. You can see that you look at error rates, it actually does quite good compared to uh, all these classical ones. Probably the best one for many problems is random forest. Okay, I'm not gonna go through convex programming, that's a way of motivating uh, interior point methods from this MM perspective, which is a big deal in, in optimization theory. I just go to some comments about uh, convergence. So if you have convexity of your objective, these algorithms tend to converge to the unique optimal point. So there are a class of problems where they're known to per perform very w well. If you don't have convex functions, then about all you can say is if you look at the stationary points of the function, the algorithm will tend to converge to one of the stationary points. But it may not be a local optimum, maybe a saddle point. There are methods for accelerating these algorithms. Uh, I won't go into them. The same problem uh, of slow convergence is an issue on many EM algorithms. And I have explored, if you look at my book, there are ways of accelerating these MM algorithms, which are carry over to the EM context automatically, and they can be quite spectacular. So even if you have slow convergence, it may be something you can fix. Okay, so what are the challenges here? Uh, for you, it's to recognize that algorithm construction should be principled, and there are principled ways of constructing algorithms that work in high dimensions. That transmission tomography example is an example of a very high dimensional problem. It got reduced to a, a very simple sequence of one dimensional problems and is therefore solvable in reasonable time. Uh, there are issues in understanding the theory behind these algorithms, particular ones quantifying the rate of convergence, uh, particularly if you have constraints. This is a, a huge issue. And that's tied in with estimating the computational complexity of the algorithms. Um, but in my experience, this class of algorithms can do things that many other algorithms can't touch. Okay, so I'll, I'm going to end there with uh, some references and take any remaining questions we have.